Let's start by jumping into uh, the capacity thing that we're doing the other day. So try this through here. Six volts, capacity, and then the battery, 12 ohm resistor. Okay, capacitor is completely discharged. Who can tell me the current in the circuit now? One thing to do is treat the capacitor as just a variable voltage battery. So what does it mean for the capacitor to be completely discharged? It's acting like a battery with a voltage of what? What's our capacitor voltage right now? Capacitor is completely discharged. Zero. Exactly right. So that's like the circuit acts like there's a six volt battery here and a zero volt battery here. Okay, what's a zero volt battery going to do? Is it going to do anything? Or when you put zero volt batteries in your flashlights, do they like the flashlight bulb? Not, not very well. Okay, so how many total volts do we have in our circuit then? We get six volts over on the left, and we get no volts on the right. We get six volts. Okay, who can tell me the current in the circuit? Right now, fast fluid discharge, acts like a zero-volt battery. Is it? How many? No, it's not zero. Is it six? The voltage is six. The current is one-half. Thank you. It's the voltage over the resistance, right? Resistance is 12 ohms up there, and our voltage is six volts. And that six volts is showing up across the resistance. Okay, so now we've got half an amp of current heading off through the resistor and continuing on to the capacitor. What does that do for the capacitor now? The capacitor is now charging. Okay, as the capacitor charges, its voltage increases. Okay, so at some point, we will get to a capacitor with a voltage of 2 volts. Okay, so now if you think of the capacitor as a 2 volt battery, and its positive plate is on the top, and the positive terminal on the battery is on the top. So it's like having the 6-volt battery is trying to push current clockwise around the circuit, and the 2-volt battery, our capacitor, is trying to push current counterclockwise around the circuit. Okay. So it's not the same as 6 volts and 0 volts, but who's going to win this battery? 6 volts or 2 volts? The six, but you're going to get some basically partial cancellations. So you can imagine it as six volts trying to push current <coughs> clockwise, two volts trying to push current counterclockwise. We get a bigger push clockwise. Okay. So overall, the resistor feels like there's a what volt battery in the circuit, it's like a single battery with a voltage of four volts. So we get four volts across that resistor, and we figure out the current based on that. Okay. And then eventually, after we wait a long time, our capacitor voltage is approaching, well, who knows how long we have to wait. Depends on what we mean by how close, how close to six volts you want to get, really. But ultimately, our capacitor voltage approaches six volts. And so now we've got a six volt battery on the left, we're trying to push the current clockwise. We've got a six volt, almost six volt battery on the right, trying to push it counterclockwise. Now what happens? The resistor feels like there's a battery in the circuit of how many volts? Okay, we not. That's right. Okay. That's, that's a nice way to do this capacitor circuit. Think of it as a variable voltage battery to for a lot of intensive purposes. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, let's get to this. Circuit that was on the worksheet the other day and we didn't get to, so I reprinted it for today's worksheet, which is this one. And there's some questions on that uh, In this circuit, the battery voltage is 24 volts, resistor A is 4 ohms, resistor B is 8 ohms. But at the instant the switch is closed, the capacitor voltage is 8 <coughs> volts with the top plate positive. Anybody got an answer? Who likes? Two amps. Two amps. Okay. Anybody else got an answer? Who likes two amps? Yeah. You like one point three three? Yeah. Um, Amanda, you had one. 
That's one amp, one plus three, three, two amps. What else do I get? Three amps over here. Okay, so we're all in the place. Fine. So, what immediately after the, you close the switch, what is the voltage on the capacitor? Eight. Just hasn't had time to change yet. Okay? So it's eight volts on the capacitor. Okay? How are the capacitor and that resistor being wired in the, in the circuit? They are in parallel with each other. Okay. What do you know about two things that are in parallel? Something is the same. Two things in parallel. And that is the voltage. Okay. Who can tell me the voltage Christ resistor B? Eight volts. Okay, good. Then you can use that to get the current. Okay, so we're not doing anything you haven't seen before, right? It's just like these things are in parallel. Things in parallel have the same voltage. We know the voltage on one of them already. The voltage on the other one's the same thing. And we're just doing ohm's law. It's a resistor. Current is voltage crash resistor, 8 ohms. Divided by the resistance, 8 ohms. That's it. Questions on that? Try the next question. See how far you get with that. You can find the next question. Okay, what do we got? You bet? Yeah, 16. 16! Yes! Who likes that? 16! I'm being excited for 16 up here. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, what are we using to get 16 here? What? The loop rule, exactly right. So, take a loop. There's the battery, up by 24. You go across the resistor A, you're down by something. You go across, I don't care which one you pick, right? Go across faster, go across the resistor B, 8 volts, you're down by 8 volts doing that. Okay, 24 minus something minus 8 equals 0. What's the sum? You got to be 16. So you get 24 volts across the, the uh, battery, from the battery across the battery. Resistor A voltage plus the parallel stuff voltage has to be 24. Here's my loop roll. I'm going. 24 volts up when I go from the minus side of the battery to the plus side. Then I go down by IARA, that's the voltage across the resistor A. And then I go down by 8 volts, I don't care which way you go, either through the capacitor or through the resistor B, it's down by 8 volts. Okay, so IARA is 16, 24 <coughs> volts minus 16 minus 8 is 0, so that. And then the current is just dumped to your bra. Okay, are we okay with that? Any questions on this so far? So we're doing fairly simple rules, right? Voltages across things in parallel are the same. Loop rule, you know, things like that. Uh, current in the capacitor. Okay, who's got that? Yeah. Four. Four. Okay, make a save for four again. <laughs> All right, who agrees with four? Canada. You know you want to know. Sorry. Okay, what else we got then? Is that four? Do you like it to trust? Three? Who likes three? Five people. Okay, that's more than three. Okay. Anybody like anything else? Three? Four? Okay. So what is the capacitor doing, by the way? Is the capacitor charging or discharging at this point? So we just did the loop rule to do one thing. What's the other rule we have? Some other Junction rule, maybe that's important thing. Okay, let's try find a junction. Right where the top middle is a junction in the circuit. Right where RA and the capacitor meet kind of there, there's a junction. How much current do we have coming into that junction? Four for sure. Coming through RA. How much current then goes off through RB? One. Okay. Four is not equal to one, is it? We're going to have some missing three somewhere. Where can it come from? Or, sorry, it's really not where it comes from, it's where it goes. We get four coming in, we get one going away this way, we get three, the other three has got to go down. Through there. Okay, just the junction rule. Four in coming in, got to be total of four going away. We're accounted for one. The fast one's got to count. Okay, so far? Okay. Okay, so basically we know everything about this uh, when the, just immediately after the switch is closed. So oh, the capacitor is now charging. So the voltage on the capacitor is going to do what? Increase. Increase. 
Okay, so, and as the voltage on the capacitor increases, what's the voltage of cross resistor B going to do? Increase or decrease? How is B connected to the capacitor? They are wired in parallel. So they always have the same single? And all the time, all the time, right? All the time. So voltage on the capacitor goes up, voltage on resistor B just has to follow it. Got to match it at all times. And ultimately, there's an equilibrium reached in the circuit. So, a long time after the switch has been closed, it comes to this equilibrium. Everything's kind of stable after that. So, what are these stable values of current through the battery and capacitor voltage? See if we can get those numbers. The key is to realize that after a long time, everything settles down to constant values. Unlike now, where right at the beginning it looks like this, and immediately, you know, tenth of a second later, different numbers. What if the capacitor gets to 24 volts? Is that the kind of steady state in the circuit? The capacitor reaches 24 volts, that matches the battery. That was what happened the other day when we just had our series, simple series circuit, RC battery. 24 volts of air, 24 volts ultimately on the capacitor. Is that where this circuit is? One thing you can think about is start it out at 24 volts, okay? Put 24 volts on your capacitor. And the battery is 24 volts. Okay. How much is left for the resistor A? Enough. Okay. Delta V is IR. You get no voltage stress through resistor A. You got no current through resistor A. Okay. No currents coming from the left side of the circuit. Exactly. However, you get 24 volts across the capacitor, you can have a voltage across resistor B. 24 volts. You got three amps of current through resistor B. 24 volts, 8 ohms, that's three amps. Not, nothing is coming from the battery. Three amps is coming to resistor B from somewhere. Where is it coming from? The capacitor, that's fine. But what's the capacitor doing? It's discharging like crazy. It's providing three amps of current to resistor B. Its voltage is dropping like a rock. So if you started off where we did at 8, it goes up. You start at 24, it comes down. 24 volts on the capacitor is not a steady state condition. It's somewhere else. So, let's figure out where it is. Anybody figure out where it was? The final volts across the capacitor, you get a number? It's not 8, it's not 24. So, bigger than 8, less than 24. Okay, let's see what our thought process is here. Okay. So we know when we started out at 8 volts, the capacitor is charging because we have lots of current going down through it. It's uh, voltage going up. And that has a cor corresponding increase in the voltage across B. And so B's current is going up. Okay. What is A's current doing? What is A's voltage doing? A's voltage is going down, right? The sum of the B voltage and the A voltage add up to 24. There's a loop there. We can make a loop for a while. So we know for sure increase charging it faster brings its voltage up. That increases the resistor voltage, resistor B voltage. It's going to match the capacitor voltage. And so resistor A voltage goes down. And that has a corresponding decrease in the current. Who knows about capacitor current? So we did have really resistor A was providing all the current costs coming from the battery through resistor A to that junction and then we're decreasing the amount of current now coming into that junction, right? And we're increasing the amount we're sending from the junction to, to B. So there are two good reasons why the capacitor current is now less than what it was before. Right? There's less coming into the junction above it, and more of it is going off to B. Okay, so now what? So the key thing is that when we reach the equilibrium, how much current is going through C? 
when we reach equilibrium, is the capacitor charging or discharging? At equilibrium. Everything reaches a steady state. Capacitor charging or discharging? Neither one. Exactly right. So how much current is going to the capacitor when we reach equilibrium? None. Exactly. Does that sound okay? Reach equilibrium. No current for the capacitor. Okay. So all the current that goes through A at that point is going on to go through where? Go to B. So you can make a real nice loop roll and solve for that current. Okay. So you can set up a loop roll that looks like this. Starting from the battery, 24 volts. Some equilibrium current through RA, and all that current goes up through RB. Okay. And so we can solve for the equilibrium situation. There's two amps, in fact, provided to the battery. It's simply, as far as the battery's concerned, it's a simple series circuit with those two resistors. Capacitors doing nothing. However, the capacitor is charged. It's the same as the voltage across something else. Across B. How many volts do we have across B at this point? Delta B is IR, 16. Exactly right. You get two amps and eight ohms for resistor B, 16 volts. And we got two amps and uh, four ohms through RA, that's eight volts, eight volts, 60 volts, that's 24, that works out. 16 volts of the on the capacitor when we're done. If you were to add the voltage across the capacitor, the battery initially divided by two sets of ohms. Right? You still get 16. Right. Adding the initial voltage on the capacitor to the initial battery voltage would cost the battery voltage. Then divided by two, it gets you 16, you're absolutely right. But that's totally pushing it. Okay? Because I could start at 7 volts on the capacitor, and we'll still end up with the exact same place we end up next. So the capacitor voltage is only 8 volts at this equilibrium state because it's in parallel with resistor B. Which That's right. Point. The capacitor is only 8 volts at the end because it's got to match what RB is doing. Okay. The 2 amps is what that battery is going to provide to the circuit forever and ever and ever until it runs out. Once the capacitor settled down to 8 volts, 16 volts, 16 volts. The capacitor only reached 16 volts. Yes, it did. Why is that? Well, it's really because of the combination of RA and RB. Okay? You can adjust RA and RB to make whatever final voltage you want on the capacitor. You tell me what you want, and I'm going to give you a combination of RA and RB. It'll give you that on the capacitor. Somewhere between 0 and 24, I give you whatever you want, whatever, depending on what you pick for our Does that sound okay? Okay. Yes? Um, the current through the battery is zero? No, the current through the battery is definitely not zero. That's the goal. What's the current through the battery? Two amps. The capacitor current is zero. That's what's good. Okay. Are we good with faster resistors? Maybe? Okay. Okay. If you want to label a lot of potential, you can do it just like that. So you can label potential at various points. And again, I arbitrarily choose the negative term of the battery to be zero, plus 24 on the other side. And then there's 16 volts across RB. That's consistent with RB going from plus 16 volts to zero. And there's 8 volts across RA, 24 volts on one side, 18 volts on the other side, potential difference is 8 volts between each. And the left side's higher than the right side. Okay, so any questions on how I labeled these? Potential? And again, I picked an arbitrary reference point, 0, to start with. What's really key is potential difference, not the actual numbers here, but the differences between various spots. Okay, so the whole thing of today was mostly actually uh, magnetic field. And force on a charged particle in a magnetic field. And you did a whole first session on that, and uh, we should talk about some of the issues that came up there. You wrote all sorts of interesting comments 
Uh, the three sessions, please. Okay, so what do you know about the Earth's field? Who can tell me anything about the Earth's magnetic field? First of all, is there one? Yes. Okay. What do you know about it? Who can tell me anything at all that you know about the Earth's magnetic field? Is it said in the book that it like, protects us from like solar winds or solar or something? It's said in the book that it protects us from solar winds and stuff like that. Yeah, and it does. It's a real protective shield for the Earth. We are very lucky to have this magnetic field. Okay, there's all sorts of radiation come in, theme the Earth, and there's cosmic mutations and all that stuff, and we didn't have this magnetic field. Very important. Uh, anybody know anything else about the Earth's magnetic field? How about magnetic field in general? Do we know what symbol we use to represent magnetic field? Do we know what units it be? So that's a three session for this. Units for magnetic field? Any ideas? Tesla. Okay. Named after uh, Nikola Tesla. First magnetic field in Tesla is around 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. How about this? Which pole of a magnet attracts the north pole of a compass? The South Pole, exactly. Okay. Which way does the compass point on the Earth? You take out your compass, never had one, never seen one, and the North Pole of the compass, which is a North Pole, magnetic North Pole, that's what it is, points which direction? The end of the compass points, uh, points north. Yes, it does. Surprisingly. <laughs> so what does that tell you about what? Is up near the geographic north pole of the Earth. What kind of magnetic pole is it? South. It is, in fact, a south magnetic pole. Has it always been like that? No, it hasn't. Okay. Every once in a long while, something happens inside the Earth with the swirling currents, etc., etc., and the Earth's magnetic field reverses. And then we get a magnetic north pole up there. And we are long overdue for one of these, these uh, flips, by the way. And some people think we're actually maybe heading into one at the moment. Because the Earth's magnetic field, uh, the, where the pole is located, is actually moving around quite a bit. And that's the, uh, and it's, the magnetic field is dropping. Yeah? What is that? You So the Earth couldn't care less, right? The Earth keeps spinning. It's, it's really the life on the Earth that is really affected by this. So if there's a reversal, you go through a period of about a thousand years where the magnetic field is very, very small. And that's really important impacts on life. And then there's stuff like birds and microbes that use the magnetic field for navigation. And they're completely screwed up by this field. Flip the message. Okay, so all sorts of things get shaken out. Fascinating stuff. Electric and magnetic fields. Anything similar between electric fields and magnetic fields? Any differences? And we're going to treat electric fields as kind of one phenomenon, magnetic fields as a different phenomena, but they are related in really interesting and spooky ways. Ultimately, I'm going to get to that as the course goes on. Okay, so what we do know is that electric fields are produced by charged particles. There are two types of charges we call positive and negative. Magnetic fields are associated with two types of poles. Okay? Now don't get these things confused. Okay? Positive and negative charges are one thing, and north and south poles are something else. And interestingly, those things also, you can trace them back to charged particles, but not stationary charges, they're moving charges. Moving charges produce magnetic fields, and you can exert forces on moving charges with magnetic fields. This is the same. Like poles of Bell, unlike poles of track, like we had like charges repel, unlike charges attract. That's super. Okay. So electric field points in the direction of the force experienced by a positive charge, and magnetic field points in the direction of the force experienced by a north pole. So we can have like the north pole of a compass needle act as our kind of test, test pole, test magnet. Just like we have a test charge. Okay, there's some important differences. So you can have a positive charge, a negative charge, they exist separately from one another. As far as we know, the North and South Pole always come in pairs. People have theorized about magnetic monopoles, but no one's seen one yet, to the best of my knowledge. The other thing is, when you draw field lines, electric field lines, 
start them off on positive charges, you end them on negative charges. Magnetic field lines are continuous loops. Okay, so you can start them off, you pick up a magnet with a north pole and a south pole, okay? Let's say the red end is the north pole. And you would draw them coming out of the north pole and wrapping around going into the south pole. However, they don't stop at the south pole, they actually keep going. So inside the magnet, they run from the south over to the north. So you get these continuous loops. Okay. And then we get this deep force relationship. So here, let me remind you about the force exerted on a charged particle by an electric field, just F is QE. Okay. And so if you went through the video, you would see lots of things which don't happen with electric fields. No force is applied in a stationary charge by a magnetic field. And in fact, even if it's moving, if it's moving in just the right direction, it still doesn't notice there's a magnetic field. None of that stuff applies to electric fields. If you reverse the sign of the charge, that reverses the direction of the force. That's exactly what we saw over there. Electric field sucks the same, actually. The force is proportional to Q, we saw that with the electric field. Proportional to the strength of the field, we saw that with the electric field. And then it's proportional to the speed. We had no speed dependence of any kind in the electric field. F is QE, that's it. No V's around there at all. So this is very interesting. So if V goes to zero, we got no force. And so we write down this for the magnitude of the force, the QVV sine theta. We didn't mean sine theta either. <coughs> theta is the angle between the velocity and the field. Okay, the velocity and the field can be at any angle you want with respect to each other. Right? Parallel perpendicular, 27.2 degrees. You name it, you can do it. The interesting thing about this is that the force is always perpendicular to the velocity and always perpendicular to the field. Now, some of you pointed out some interesting kind of word choices on preset degrees, which I think you have a good point there. For instance, uh, one of the options was the force is always perpendicular to the velocity. And I wanted you to check that as an option. Okay? Which is generally true, but in fact, once in a while, there's no force, right? So, if there's no force, well, it doesn't be perpendicular to it, so you've got a good point there. So, I should have said, when there is a force applied on the charge by the field, it is always perpendicular to the velocity. That's interesting. Similarly, when there is a force, then it's also always perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay. We didn't have any of that going on with the F is QE, right? Force and field are in the same direction, the exact opposite direction. Not none of those funny perpendicular things. Okay, and then we've got this is just the magnitude, right? Then we got a whole other thing that gives us the direction. And we have the right hand rule, which we'll go over. And I hope you all brought your right hand. I should have reminded you. I'm sorry. Next time, bring your right hand back there. Okay? Okay. And then we had, there was this, which is what I was looking for is an explanation on the precepts, right? Why? Can't this force change the speed? So the real issue is, okay, let's say I have something traveling with a velocity this way, to the right. If I apply a force on that to the right, a net force, it's already moving to the right, I apply a net force to the right, what's it gonna do? Speed up, slow down, speed up. Okay. If, I, if it's moving to the right and I apply a force to the left, I'm gonna make it slow down. So to make something speed up, you have to have a force component parallel to the velocity. To make it slow down, you need a force component opposite to the velocity. This force is neither one of those. It's always perpendicular to the velocity. Okay, so it can neither make it speed up nor slow down. The one thing it can do is change the direction. And in fact, we get circular motion. I know you guys thought you were done with uniform circular motion after that night period that we put into last semester, so on that side. It's facts. Okay, so you gotta remember it all again. Okay? So. Okay, let's go through this right hand rule. We'll go through it twice. First of all, 
strangely, you use your right hand for it. Okay? Not your left hand, your right hand. Some of you may have used various right hand rolls or even left hand rolls in the past. Who has ever done any kind of these cool things before? Okay. And the only people, some people actually use left hand rolls. Anybody use the left hand roll? Strangely, I've only ever seen people from New York and Kuwait use left hand rolls. I don't know why. Because <laughs> none of you guys are in that room. So what you do is you take your fingers and first you point them in the direction of velocity. Okay, so let's say your velocity is to the right. There's lots of ways to orient your hands so your fingers go right. right? So how do you know where to stop rotating? Well, what you should have is your palm pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So let's say the magnetic field is up. Okay, so then you have your palm on it. And you curl your fingers into the direction of the magnetic field. And you look at which way your thumb goes. And so everybody's thumb should be going toward the back of the room at this point. And that's the force on the particle. As long as the particle is what? As long as it's positive. And if it's negative, if it's negative, your right hand lies at you. Okay? And you've got to go in the opposite direction. You say, okay, I'm going to pretend it's a positive charge. I'm going to do the right hand roll. I'm going to get toward the back of the room. Oh, it's an electron. It's really still in front of the room. That's the way it works. You gotta go through that line. Think about whether it's a plasma charge or not. Okay, so let's go through that again with pictures. Here we go. This is my daughter's hand when she was about six. Okay, so she can do it when she was six. You guys can do it. Even you. Okay, so here we go. Here's a positive charge. Velocity is this way. Lots of ways to orient your hand so your fingers point in the direction of the velocity, right? But what you want to do is stop rotating when your palm points in the direction of the field. Okay, so that means like this, field's going to the left. Curl your fingers in the direction of the field, look at which way your thumb points. It points out of the screen. Again, toward the back of the room. Okay? Use the different right hand rule. Okay, good enough. You want get your own right hand rule to work? Stick with it. Okay, go for it. Questions on this? Okay, let's try one example. This is where we're going to end today, and then we'll do some more examples next time. Let's start with this. Here's the, four, here's the charge, velocity, field. Tell me about the force. Which way is the force? Let's go. We've got a minute on that. <laughs> Okay, one is only up, two is only down. <laughs> up, by the way, is this way, this is up, this is down, out of the screen, into the screen, okay, right, left. And you think it's more than one of those, you can pick a combination. Okay, everybody should be getting the ratings going. Go!